Great, thanks. Thank you so much. So fleet air reconnaissance, right? So that means absolutely nothing to you. Actually, it meant absolutely nothing to me, except I had to learn how to spell reconnaissance, and I kept screwing up. <laughs> how many N's? How many S's? I remember writing my first letter to the CO going, I probably shouldn't spell reconnaissance wrong. Actually, we had nothing to do with reconnaissance. My squadron, uh, C-130 and then E-6 time, um, was doing nuclear command and control. And so many of you, uh, if you have missile ear background or you aspire to be a missile ear, we are of a kindred, uh, we are of a kindred background or, or your future. So um, my job, my current assignment as the senior advisor for uh, military professionalism. Anybody want to take a guess? So it's a new position, it's a two-year position, and Dr. Johnson, you don't get to answer um, because she knows. But any of you want to guess why, how, not I, but how somebody became the senior advisor to the secretary on military professionalism, otherwise known as the ethics are? Guesses. Because I know what most of you had for lunch, so we're going to be interactive so you stay awake. What, no, no, no. Why do you think the office was stood up? Any guesses? Or you might remember from the news, because it made the news. Which probably tells you right there it wasn't a good news story. Go ahead. Um, so it was actually, um, that was one of the things, although that was still in the background. Um, any other guesses? Any other? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, 2013, there were some flag and general officer misconduct that made the press. And, you know, the way it ends up working is kind of when there's blood in the water, right? Every incident, regardless of whether it's current or just kind of hits the news threshold, kind of makes it into the press. So, 2013 was not exactly a banner year for flag and general officer publicity. And the chairman and the secretary of defense, Secretary Hagel at the time, had a conversation about who's, who is in charge of ethics. Who do you have running ethics in the services? And the service chiefs all said, we are. We are the chief ethics officers of our service. And, and oh, by the way, we don't necessarily think we need you to help us do our job. And, and I mean, that was quite a candid conversation. So that was 2013. In early 2014, there was an Air Force uh, missile ear cheating uh, incident and a Navy uh, nuclear power cheating incident. And the secretary said, I respect what, you, what the service chiefs say, but I want somebody on my staff who is devoted, who's dedicated to improving professionalism across the services. So what they told me was, they stood up the office, it's, and the intent is for it to be um, stood up for two years. I went to each of the service chiefs and I asked them for one person. General Odierno gave me two, which was really helpful because he said, I'm going to give you a colonel. I just asked for somebody who had had command experience and the only other character trait I specified was I needed somebody to be collaborative. General Odierno gave me an 06, a post command 06, and he gave me a senior NCO, which was brilliant because the NCO perspective, while it was flag and general officers that got us into the news, it was not going to be, this was not an office that was going to be focused solely on the officer corps. So we stood up our team, but the first few months we spent looking around at what already existed. We went to academia. We went to corporate America, and of course, we went to all the services to see what kind of programs each of the services has. And you say, has to do what? My charter was to improve the level of professionalism across the services, across the department. And I literally took a piece of butcher block paper in my office, then in the joint staff, and I said, what's in our box? And we basically said, officer enlisted civilian, because we can't go to war without them. I said that we also needed to include on a time continuum, we really needed to start at accessions and, and end with retirement. Because you can't just, I didn't see that there was an effective way to focus on, you know, let's say 0405 or 0506 command. So there really wasn't just a, a way to focus on one particular time frame. So in my box is improving the level of professionalism 
officer enlisted civilian across the time continuum from when we bring you in to when we wish you, as we say in the Navy, fair winds and following seas to your life as a retired, um, as a member of the re retired member of the Department of Defense. So we kind of, we had this matrix and we looked at all the things, all the press articles. I had like a 20 pages of really small font incidents when we pulled the press articles for past year and from the previous year. And, and you know, so I said, okay, so, so what, right? So we have all this behavior. Um, and we kind of, you know, we sliced and diced it. And, and it was at that point that I said, wait a minute, you know, I, I am not going to play whack-a-mole with this week it's alcohol, last week it was substance abuse, it's, it's suicide prevention, which is a little different from ethics, but it certainly overlaps. Um, there's, of course, the large elephant in the room is sexual assault. And so I decided we were going to go out and look at what the services were doing, what academia was doing. And then we kind of stumbled upon, and I shouldn't say stumbled upon because General Dempsey has been writing about the profession of arms since, nine, since he was a major. Okay, he's a four star now. He's been a four star for several years um, since he was a major. So he wrote this great paper in 1988. If you have any connections at the Army War College, you should really, really read the paper because it's fantastic or I, I can send it to you, you don't have to Google it. But, but we really decided that what do we know, what do we know now that we didn't know the last time we kind of did one of these assessments that we really underwent a period of institutional reflection. We've done that, we do that about every 20 years as a department, right? Each of the services has their own reasons for conducting institutional reflection. The Army has probably the biggest infrastructure to do these things. So in the late, seven, or in the 70s, uh, they, they, did a, uh, they did a massive study for the Army to understand how to, how to develop leaders. And then they also had a period of self-reflection after, after Desert Storm, but the paper was not as, uh, it was not as much a touchstone as the work that they did in the 70s. So we kind of looked at this paper in the 70s and we said, what's changed? I'll tell you what's changed, science has changed. We know so much more today about, about the human brain, about decision making, a lot of it is because of traumatic brain injury, and so we've been working across uniform and civilian lines um, to, to understand that. So science has changed a lot, bless you. What does that have to do with you? Well, let me take it, not down, but let me take it across the academic or intellectual spectrum a couple different areas. Character, right? A lot of what we see on the bad news side is, is character failings. And, and there are intellectuals in the room who would say, well, it's not exactly character, but just work with me here for just a moment. So when, but, but a large majority of the time, the way we are combat effective, the way we do our job well, is because we, we value character. And one of the things General Dempsey said um, last year was he said, you know, if people were asking him, have we taken our, you know, have we really taken our eye off the ball as that's what's happened? And, and he, uh, General Dempsey said a couple times, he said, we have focused more on competence than on character. So we kind of pulled that thread a little bit. And really, it's pretty easy to kind of step on that virtual scale and measure character when you're talk, or measure competence when you're talking about technical and tactical attributes, right? You can, bombs on target, right? You can measure that. You can measure how well a manager um, executes their budget. You can, uh, th there's so many tangible measures. But when you get to character and you put your toe on that scale to kind of change it, it's really difficult to measure. So we looked at that and we said, well, okay, instead of trying to measure character, right, because it, it is really hard to measure that, what are some of the key components that, that create good leaders and good organizations? Because it's not just about, 
It's not just about people, it's about good organizations, right? One of the things that those of us in uniform and as well as our civilian DOD counterparts, we don't just, we don't just get up in the morning, put on our mirror and go, wow, I look good, right? We do it for a reason. Our, our purpose is that we, inside the Department of Defense, we're an instrument of national power. The president wants to be able to call on us and he wants us to be ready. Well, what I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about is it is equally important, and maybe you can argue amongst yourselves, um, that it is more important that your character, that you have developed your character, and that your character is ready when called. It is just as important as your technical and tactical competence is that you're ready when called, right? Because we all think of, when you think of the fire department, and the fire department's pretty easy to think about, right? When the fire, when, if you pull the fire alarm, you want the fire department to be ready. And you don't really, when you, I mean, if you're in an emergency, if there's a lot of pressure and stress, you don't really care about their character. But when we are out managing, man, that's a gross generalization, and if there are fire department members out here, it's a gross generalization. I see a uniform up there that might be fire department, but anyway, no. Um, anyway, character, right? As people who manage violence, right? If you go back to Huntington's profession of arms, as people who manage violence, we absolutely care about character, and your character development has to help ready you for any mission that you could be called to. So to that end, I want to tell you a story, one modern, one not so modern. And one should kind of make you thinking about walking across the campus today in the snow and the bitter cold temperatures and the wind. 1950, Korea, Chosan Reservoir, off an aircraft carrier. There's two aviators flying, I think, F4Fs. Don't hold me to that. And, and Kevin's not here to help me, help get my facts straight. Um, one of the aviators is, um, is from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And it just so happens he is the first African-American aviator to get his wings in the Navy. I don't know when that happened for the Air Force, but it took us till 1950 to put wings of gold on our first naval aviator who was an African-American. Not something I'm proud of, but anyway, Jesse Brown, Lieutenant Jesse Brown was his name. He had met on, on their deployment on the aircraft carrier that they were on, um, he had met a gentleman by the name of Lieutenant Junior Grade Tom Hudner, who was not from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. As a matter of fact, the only thing that Tom Hudner and Jesse Brown had in common was the fact that they were, they were wingmen together. Jesse was the senior officer, Tom was the junior officer. Tom came from uh, Massachusetts. Uh, his family had a significant amount of affluence. He went to Phillips Andover, Phillips Exeter. I, not, I know they're not the same, but anyway, he went to a very, very good prep school, right, to get him ready to go to the Naval Academy. He graduated from the Naval Academy, went to flight training, and, and, uh, and ended up on this carrier deployment in 1950 with Jesse Brown. Jesse Brown, um, entered Pensacola, entered flight training with a hundred people where six graduated, six African Americans graduated. Again, not something we're proud of. And, and Pensacola, right, I've, I've spent a lot of time in Pensacola, it's a beautiful place, but I can imagine what kind of world it was in 1950. Not really anything that we're really proud of today. Jesse Brown was shot down and uh, surface to air, uh, surface to air fire. And, um, and when he was shot down, uh, Tom Hudner, his wingman, heard, uh, heard a mayday over the radio. So he knew that Jesse was alive. And they had developed this relationship, the bond that many uh, develop in combat. Uh, they developed the bond. So Tom Hudner kind of looks around, assesses what resources are available to go in to rescue Jesse because Jesse's alive. Well, Tom Hudner decides to crash his airplane, and for that, uh, for that uh, disobedience of probably every rule in naval aviation, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. He made a split-second decision, right, because the F-4s, they don't carry much, all right, so you're talking to a big wing person who taught, you know, we carry lots of gas, the F-4F's not a lot of gas, right, so he made a split-second decision 
that went against probably every amount of tactical training that he ever received. But what he did was show character that I really hope that if I were in such a situation, I would display the same character. He was there. He crashed his jet, again, North Korea, right? Not sure how far the adversary is. And then he figured out um, that Jesse was trapped, he was pinned in his airplane, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't one of these TV miracle stories. Jesse died in his aircraft. But he didn't die alone, and he didn't die for lack of his wingman trying to get him out. And, and you can, you can read the Tom Hudner, Jesse Brown story on the internet, depending on your interest. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing the conditions, right? So I'm a wimp, right? I like put on my big coat to just walk from one building to another, right? They're out there in 30 below, right? 30 below wind chill factor. Out there trying to free somebody who our society at large didn't value as equals, right? Nobody in society looking from the outside in would have said, that, you know, they're equals. In Tom Hudner's mind, they weren't just equals, this was his wingman. So how did Tom Hudner get there, right? How did Tom Hudner do that? Well, I guarantee you, he had conversations, well, we, he had conversations like you do. At the Naval Academy, he had conversations about character, about what it means to develop. He had conversations in his ready room, similar to um, Admiral Stockdale, who was a Vietnam POW. Um, the conversations Admiral Stockdale had as the senior POW, senior POW in, the, in the Hanoi Hilton, right? I'm sure that they, like you, this morning, you got to see this fantastic heritage video, right? Standing on the shoulders of giants, reaching back and understanding that our responsibility, our, and I'm talking about those of us who have fewer years in front of them that you have in, than you have in front of you, right? You have many more years, not even that there's hundreds of you. You have many more, a sample one of you has a lot more years in front of you in uniform than I do, right? So what I owe you and what I owe the secretary is I owe you the tools to do your job better. So you are better able to do your job, not only because the security environment is more complex, but because what the generation ahead of me handed me was they handed me tools so I could be better than them. I owe the same thing to you. And that, after 20 minutes of talking, that's what the secretary offered us. One of the things that we found, though, is storytelling, connecting people who exhibit moral courage. Okay, I don't, uh, maybe there's a Tom Hudner out here, but I'm, I, I don't pretend to be Tom Hudner. So what does this human do? Well, this human does a lot of reading. And, and what do I read? I read about the fact that simple acts of talking about your challenges to your subordinates changes behavior for the positive doesn't change it forever, so like booster shots, you need to kind of have some routine in mind as you accept responsibility, greater and greater amounts of responsibility. You need to make sure you kind of have a plan. Am I going to talk about this every three months? Am I, you know, do I talk about this every time we have a safety stand down? You know, whatever. There's not a time frame. Or maybe, maybe there are teachable moments, you know, in, in school, here, you know, so, so and I, it's a fantastic opportunity to gather all of you together and there's some fantastic speakers that I got to hear not only this morning, Chief Cody, holy cow, he was fantastic. General Johnson telling you to reflect, I'll tell you, none, uh, so I will speak for the Navy. In the Navy, we don't, we don't acknowledge the value, nor do we motivate, incentivize people to reflect. It's incredibly important to reflect. But Chief Cody, Chief Cody talked to, to the cadets ex specifically, you have a responsibility to your airmen. So this is why you should think about these things. Let me fast forward to something maybe less heroic, um, certainly didn't offer them, uh, certainly didn't cause them to be awarded the Medal of Honor, but I had a Marine Expeditionary Unit assigned to me in 2010, 2011. 
Anybody ha remember what happened February, March of 2011 in the Middle East? This is where I still make sure you're awake. Go ahead. So that happened in May, yep, sure thing, sure did. Uh, May of 2011, yep, February, March. Anybody else want to venture a guess? Go ahead. So that was Tunisia, that was the Arab Spring. So Arab Spring happened, Tunisia, Bahrain, um, Libya, right? So let me bring you to a, an unfamiliar place, unless there's Navy, Navy veterans in the crowd. Not a single, oh, one. Okay, one, outstanding. So USS Kearsarge is what we call a helicopter carrier. So not as big as an aircraft carrier, but we carry Marines around. So I was the amphibious task force commander at the time, and I, I, whatever made me qualified after have, doing cyber and nuclear command and control, I'm not sure what made me qualified to do amphibious operations, but again, I prepared as, your, you know, as it was my, my responsibility. So we found ourselves on board the, our, my flagship was the USS Kearsarge. They had been sent on deployment a month early. So here's their first teachable moment. When we go on deployment, similar to the Air Force, when you get deployed overseas, right, you're expected to be at a certain readiness level, right? Again, thinking in your mind, character's part of this, but they had a readiness level. Well, they were deployed six weeks early. So that leadership team had the, had the opportunity to go, oh yeah, yes sir, yes general, yes admiral, we are ready, right? Six weeks early. How did you do that right? You didn't need those six weeks to get ready? They made the tough call and they said, no, we're going to need, you. we can get underway to go help the Pakistanis with flood relief. So that's why they got underway early. But what they said was, we're going to need some additional resources, somebody to come out and go through the last few capstone exercises so that we are ready in these areas. So right, so I'm thinking, wow, somebody's really on the ball because that's not necessarily what we always see. Oh, you know, you're under the gun, get underway now, now, now. And, you know, you're supposed to get underway in August, but we're getting you underway in early July. You're ready, right? Well, yes, technically I can get ready, but I'm gonna need some help. That took some moral courage right then and there. So they get underway, they're on deployment, they are supposed to pull into port, they get turned around to go help this crisis. They're supposed to pull into port. They have to sit off the coast of Yemen in case something happens there, because Yemen was all kinds of crazy then. They're supposed to pull into port at Christmas time. They were turned around because they were needed off the coast of Djibouti. And maybe you get my point, but they just couldn't catch a break. This, this, the Kearsarge um, uh, amphibious group, amphibious ready group couldn't catch a break. So they get underway in July, and so I embark with them because we're not sure what's really going on, but I embark with them at the end of January because we see Tunisia had already happened, and, and then we're now kind of wondering what the heck is going on in Egypt. So I got underway with them. In the meantime, General Mattis, Marine Four Star, who at the time was in charge of Central Command, he had said to my boss, the 5th Fleet commander, he said, hey, I want my amphibious ready group, I want them ready, and I want you to tell me what they're ready to do. So obviously he had some ideas. This was his contingency resource. So the Marines and the Navy crew worked together for a good month while the UN worked and figured out what they, so we're past Egypt, although we did take a few people we did evacuate a few people out of Egypt um, um, in, because it was dangerous for a little while. This was well before Benghazi happened. Um, and then they said, hey, you might be needed off the coast of Libya. So we find ourselves off the coast of Libya. We find our, the UN, which is not normally known for their expeditious decision making, they passed not one but two UN Security Council resolutions to protect the people of Libya from Muammar Gaddafi. Okay, so, so here's my 06 leadership team. There were four of them. One Marine, three Navy officers. One was in charge of the ship, one was in charge of the staff. Uh, actually, two were in charge of the ships. One was in charge of staff, and one was the Marine um, in charge of the Marine Expeditionary Unit. So the Marine has his Marines, and he's got a couple thousand Marines working for him, okay? They've been stuck on the Kearsarge, and that's exactly the language they would use. They've been stuck on the Kearsarge since July, most of them, um, and, you know, doing PT, 
like you read about, right? Because the ship doesn't exactly afford them a lot of, a lot of real estate to do land war exercises, okay? So they do a lot of PT. Well, that Marine colonel is the, is the hero in this story because every day of that deployment, he was candid with his troops. He goes, some of you I'm gonna to have to push to Afghanistan. That means some of you are gonna to have to take on additional responsibilities. Because at the time, uh, 2010, we were about Thanksgiving of 2010, we were getting ready to surge. Um, when the, while Arab Spring is kind of boiling under the surface. That Marine colonel got his troops ready he articulated to his bosses up through me what they were able to do. He articulated what they were unable to do. But even more importantly, so we're a day 180 and these people hadn't pulled into port. And, and they don't get to do any of the glamorous stuff. They're not talking about how much, you know, how much, uh, how much, how many bombs on, you know, warheads on foreheads they're dropping every day because they're, they're ready. They're like, okay, we're ready. Oh, you don't need us? Okay, all right, well, we'll go back. So it's kind of like Groundhog Day. Leadership made all the difference in the world. Leadership was the difference between the Kearsarge and the Two Six Mew and Groundhog Day. Because every day he said, hey, I get that it's Groundhog Day, but that does not absolve us of our responsibility. So with about a week's notice, President, right, UN Security Council, the President, down to the AFRICOM commander, right, so that was, it was General Ward, then it was General Ham, and down through, they coordinated with Central Command commander, down to me and my group of 06s. And as we're getting ready to launch, so the President, the UN passes Security Council resolution on a Friday night, the President gives a, pe a speech Saturday morning, and Saturday afternoon, there are strategic assets on, in the air from Whiteman Air Force Base and goodness knows where else. They are for strategic assets. Tankers in the air, strategic bombers are in the air. Not to drop nukes, obviously, but anyway, big wing, right? Big wing, not, not your tactical um, attack aircraft, fighter attack aircraft. So while they're doing that, my Marines, there are five Harriers, and I think we had five Osprey, somewhere five or six Osprey V-22s um, are like, we're ready, throw us in coach. Well, in the planning with the folks at the, at the JFAC up in somewhere between Stuttgart and London, I can't remember where they were, but they said, hey, you know, we said two o'clock in the morning, they were like, hey, we can help. Hey, what do you want us to do? Hey, these are the cities work from west to east. We want to make sure Gaddafi stops bombing his people. In, in typical Soviet strat tactics, they would take their tanks in, bomb the crap out of the civil, out of the population, and then at night they'd park the tanks. So what the JFAC let us do and what the president let us do is they'd go in and they'd plink tanks every night while the Air Force had their tankers in the air and their strategic resources in the air to take out big things like fuel and ammunition depots. We're just in there plinking tanks every night. But they were ready. They were ready after a grueling Groundhog Day kind of deployment. They were ready. No excuses, no nothing. They were so ready that for the first time in the Marine Corps history, they went into Libya, and I think it was south of Benghazi, and they picked up an Air Force F-15 pilot after his airplane had a mechanical malfunction and he and his Wizzo had to eject. So Marines in their V-22, never, never before, right? They're like, we can do this. We've practiced for it, we've trained for it. The point of my story is there is as much character development that went into every single one of those decisions about how to live that, through that Groundhog Day kind of deployment till suddenly, it wasn't Groundhog Day, it was holy crap, what do you mean, you know, CNN's coming out to interview us? You know, which is a whole story beside itself. But, but there's kind of two bookends for how different people take their character development training and apply it. Now granted, Colonel Dessens was the Marine Colonel. Colonel Dessens had a little bit more than a split second to make his decision but he also had to sustain that level of readiness. And again, not just tactical and technical, he had to sustain that level of readiness. So what does this mean to you? Well, it means a lot of things. It means, first of all, you never know what life is gonna bring you, right? 
hopefully there aren't too many people who are crash landing their very expensive airplanes and their very expensive lives into, a, into a, an iceberg or in a, a glacier in North Korea. Um, but at the same time, you know, probably more the marine experience of being ready when called after sitting on alert, right? So I'm nuclear command and control. We spent a lot of time on alert and thankfully never, were never called. But that's you, right? That's your, how do you develop your character? Okay, we have lots of ways. We have lots of ways to test how your tactical and technical competence, how do you develop your character, and how do you look at your subordinates and help them understand how to grade their own character? So, I could talk a lot more, but we have about 20 to 25 minutes, and I would love to be able to field your questions. And I would tell you, ask me hard questions, because I'm, um, I've done a bunch of little things, three and a half years in the joint, two and a half years, three and a half years, something in the joint environment. I guess it's been three and a half years. Um, I'm happy to answer hard questions and what I will promise you in return is that I, I will give you candid answers when I kind of have an opinion or I'll give you the difference between opinion and fact and, and I'll give you the news of whether I think what we think, what I think we're doing well and what I think we still have room to, room to improve on. So. Questions? Go ahead. MC2C Hunter again, SDS 7. My question for you is uh, you mentioned earlier how you were like the field was shifting to that sign of the ideas of sovereignty. Could you sort of just go into more detail as far as how smooth that transition was going through and that oh. you yourself said you might not have that all three initials? Sure. Sure. Yeah, so, so the question is about how did I transition from the nuclear field to being in charge of amphibious forces? One of the beautiful things, one of the things we do really well, and each of the services does it, is you don't take an 01, pull you out of the Air Force Academy, and send you to command 2,500 troops, right? We give you a little bit of responsibility, then we give you a little more responsibility, and we build on that. So I had, um, and each service is a little bit different in their command model. I, I really, I don't, the West Point person, don't let this go to your head. I like the Army leadership model. I like the, I like the fact that as an 03, you are a company commander. I, I like that model. It takes a little bit more infrastructure than the Navy is willing to invest in, so we don't do that. And maybe, Klein's the, maybe Klein's the only person in the Navy who thinks it's a good model. Anyway, my experience was I had 05 command um, of about 450, 500 people, and before that I had had jobs of increasing responsibility. I then went to 06 Command where I had, I don't know, 1,500 people. And then, and then I went to the Naval Academy where that was, again, that was just, that required skills that I didn't even know I had, where it was not so much, so 4,000, 4,400 midshipmen, kind of sim very similar to here, very similar to here, where you're kind of the, you know, you are in charge of midshipmen who think they're in charge of themselves, right? So that was a lot more, that was a different leadership challenge of its own, but the superintendent who hired me said I wouldn't have hired you, right? So I was the first female commandant. At the same time, General Desjardins was the commandant here, and I said to him, I said, sir, I don't want this job if you're hiring me because I'm the first female. And he said, hey, I wouldn't hire you for that reason. I said, I'm hiring you because you're qualified. You are the most qualified. So I had that, and so that gave me some, that added sign of some skills. And so then I, then I went and did something um, in network warfare, and so I worked with that. So amphibious warfare, right, so this is my first exposure to land warfare, but I had been tested and given, so the responsibility increase and I had been tested, I, I'm trying to imagine, other than flying the same airplane two or three tours, and even that I think I was two tours in the E6 and one and a half in the C-130, um, I can't imagine, I don't think I've ever done the same job more than two times or d worked in the same field. So I had that confidence going in, but I knew what had made me ready, and I'm, and I'm here to tell you that there was some better preparation that I learned. I, I learned how to better prepare myself each time I got kind of thrown into a new career field. And so, so I read about the Falklands, and then I reached out to experts, people who had experience in amphibious operations, and 
you know, one of the things I learned along the way was, hey, ask people for help. Sometimes we're so proud that we think, oh no, that's a sign of weakness. If I ask for help, that's a sign of weakness. Get over it. It may be a sign of weakness. Guess what? You're all humans. Maybe there's a non-human in here somewhere, but the rest of us are humans. And I got to tell you, asking for help was one of my biggest barriers. And, and I got over it because I had some great bosses. As I made flag, great bosses who dissuaded me of this and, and kind of said, hey, here you go. It's called networking, right? It's like better than asking for help. We call it networking. And, and so I reached out to these people, and they were so fantastic. I mean, the folks who were the first, anyway, all kinds of great expertise going back 20, 30 years so I could understand. And uh, so anyway, great question. But yeah, all things learn, don't do what I did. Do it better. Yeah. OK, other questions? Sure. Oh, yes. Yes. So that's a great question. Thanks for firing that softball up to me. <laughs> I greatly appreciate it. Um, so here's what I think. The secretary stood the office up, and there's a couple things. First of all, he told, the, he told the service chiefs he was standing it up, you know, under a certain environment. We told Congress that we needed an extra billet. We needed a two-star billet, and we told them it was temporary. We said the same thing about Dakowitz. <laughs> Fifty years ago, we said the same thing about Dakowitz. And I, now, I don't have a lot of DC experience. As a matter of fact, I probably have less DC experience than almost any flag officer across all services. My first tour in the Pentagon was almost two years ago, OK? However, when the Ethics Office tells Congress something, I feel like we should live up to our word. So that's thing one. Thing two is, there is no way to declare victory in the challenge of helping develop leaders. Do we say, oh, we got the perfect class, we're just going to keep doing that from now on? No. I mean, nobody would ever think that. So keeping the office up and running isn't going to, the office up and running is going to serve, in my opinion, is going to serve to help get traction on those service programs that need traction, pace, kind of on the, on the model of the Army CAPE, and what I say to people in the building, it's the good CAPE, right? The Center for the Army Profession and Ethic, as opposed to OSD's CAPE, which are known for their analysts who are known for taking money from people, right? And uh, so there's good CAPE, bad CAPE. But um, you, if you ever serve in the Pentagon, you'll laugh at this in 100 years. I'm, you don't need to laugh at it now. Um, but, but programs like that, that are starting to get traction because of the uh, really outstanding leadership of people like General Welsh and General Rand, and I don't say that because I'm in a room, of, in a room full of people in Air Force Blue. I, I say that to all my, joint, all my joint folks. Those programs, every service has those kernels, with a K, not with a C-O-L, has those kernels of really good ideas and really good programs and really good people that just kind of need to be coalesced together to figure out how do we scale this, which of these really good ideas are scalable, and how do we take the things that we're learning from our millennials, because we're learning incredible amounts from our millennials, how do we take those coalesce and move them forward? OSD, OSD, this is really a uniform problem, and OSD is our civilian oversight, right? Statutorily, OSD is supposed to provide oversight. OSD is not supposed to be the organization that connects the services, right? So, so I think we can do this in two years. We can get traction on those really good programs, cause the, create some venues for the services to talk so that they are each better. And, and then the office, the work that the office is doing goes to the right level, right? Because of all the publicity, it was kind of brought up a couple, at least a level, if not a couple levels from where it should be. And so we put it back where at the level it should be inside the services and then provide that kind of periodic checks, you know, check and balance that works periodically as opposed to being there every day. That's, that's why I think the office, that's why I think we should live up to that. Because the work is absolutely valuable. The office can be put back into some other mechanism. 
Sure. So that's a great question. It, you know, I happen to know because of my experience as commandant, I happen to know um, that the um, that the service academies all have ethics programs, leader development programs that work really well. I also know that the service academies aren't funded and necessarily scaled to get that out to all to the, to the whole department, right? So. So how do, you use, how do you use those resources? Well, first of all, I think what, what the Air Force Academy has been doing is you know, having a national conference to talk about this is one way, because research shows that having the conversation changes behavior. And so if you learn anything here, it's that having that conversation about hard choices about ethical challenges changes. It brings the, th the, the thought about the ethical component of any problem to the forefront so you think about it. And so even if you only have a couple of seconds, it makes a difference. But I think your question really was, what is the role of the service academies in, in leader development, right? And, and so first of all, they do leader development for, and every service is a little bit different, um, but they do leader development for you. Some of this is going to hit you 10 years from now. Some of you are going to take it and apply it, and apply it every day. What you do for the Air Force is hopefully, not that, I, I know we, we call ourselves the cream of the crop, but I think when you go out and you integrate in your unit, whether you integrate at flight school or you integrate in your first unit, I, I, first of all, I wouldn't go in there going, hey, I'm an Air Force Academy grad. I'm better than all of you. That probably wouldn't win you a lot of compatriots. But how many of the networked, right, how many of your professors here would love to hear from you after graduation and would love to kind of say, hey, can I have an article? Can you send me like the best article you have on leader development or ethical challenges or, you know, Dr. Johnson today talked about identity, which is something you can sink your teeth into. You know, that's really something, rather than going in and saying, okay, I'm the font of all goodness, what are you going to learn from me today, right, and probably not, a, not that service, uh, not that humble service that I certainly subscribe to. Um, but by the other way that you can impact, the other way the Air Force Academy impacts the Air Force through its graduates is you lead by example. You are role models. And you're role models not by what you blah, 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 by what you do. So um, some great opportunities. And it's why the service academies are so valuable, so valuable to each of their services. Sir. Yes, thanks. That's a great question, and hopefully, um, it's you know, if I had known then what I know now, uh, what what would I do differently, or what advice would I give the cadets and other college-age students? Let me take the asking for advice and kind of pull that string a little bit. Um, you know, each service has kind of run the gamut of what does mentorship look like? Is it a big formal program or is it something very personal? Is it in the chain of command? Is it outside the chain of command? Is it by affinity group? Is it by major, right? Is it, is it by whatever specialty, right? Your AFSC, you know, what is it? Well, I'll tell you, I don't, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that you have a mentor. And that what, hap what matters is that you find somebody who maybe, this is the model that I've followed, somebody that you really connected with. with. For me, it was a couple of my bosses, and I didn't take advantage of this at the Naval Academy, and that's what I would do differently. But a couple of my professors were fantastic, and I wish I had kept in touch with them, not 
just for that moment when I'm like, throw me a lifeline or I'm going to drown, right? So it shouldn't wait till a crisis. But, but what I wish I had done was stayed in touch with them and just kept the dialogue going. Because by my talking to them, they can kind of course correct. And, and, oh, by the way, I get to hear from them about things that they know. Admiral Stockdale, and here's why I say that. Admiral Stockdale said this. OK, any philosophers in the room? Because I'm not saying this because to your benefit. Philosophy majors, no. No? No. No. OK. Hmm. Yeah, OK. Admiral Stockdale, OK, so he was a fire pilot's fighter pilot. He, was, he had been commanding officer of a fighter squadron, right? So it's hard to think of anybody more macho than fighter, right? at least by stereotype. Admiral Stockdale said that the best preparation he had for being a POW, for leading as a POW, was the year he spent at Stanford University learning philosophy. And, and when you pull that, when you peel that back a little, every week he sat with his philosophy professor. I can't remember his name. Um, but every week he sat with his philosophy professor. So sure, philosophy was a great academic and I, it was a great academic foundation. But as you read his books, it was that weekly discussion, intellectual discussion, reflection that he had that was his best preparation for being a POW. So that's why I say what I say. Sure. Ma'am. Sure, thanks. Great question. So the question is kind of what have we discovered? What I'm going to answer is what have we discovered along the way? Because we're seven people, and so we've reached out to academics and practitioners and discovered some things, and that actually that knowledge exists inside the services, but we are trying to help connect it, right? It, so, so the first thing, um, first thing is transparency. We are, as a Department of Defense, transparency is not our forte. We, it's, maybe it's because of security, maybe it's because of our, I, I can't explain our culture, but I don't think there's too many people would say that would argue that uh, with me when I say transparency is not our forte. I think that there is a greater expectation, and last night I gave an example of, of somebody who did something morally, uh, um, something that I was morally opposed to, uh, my, husband, my husband was active duty for almost 22 years. He came back from his first deployment. One of his squadron mates had done something that we found morally um, not good. So, so the point wasn't hit not his moral failing. It was the comment that was made inside the squadron was what happens on deployment stays on deployment. And I think as you reflect on the Air Force core values and as I reflect on the Navy core values, nowhere in our core values is there the fine print that says, oh, by the way, and what happens on deployment stays on deployments, right? Honor, courage, commitment. Where does that fit in with honor, courage, commitment? So it doesn't. So transparency is actually my point. Um, one of the other, um, there's a couple other things that we've found out, science. Science and, and um, the fact that you can shape behavior just by the way you frame a problem. You can bring things to the forefront. And so trying to help the services, not just in some little office of a GS5, right? You know, or, a, or an O2 or an E5, E4, E5, right? No, you want to make sure that our senior leaders understand how easy it is to promote character and ethics Inside, inside their everyday war fighting mentality, inside their war fighting, as we develop war fighters, it's really easy to develop leaders of good character. Um, 
one of the other one of the other things we stumbled upon, I j it just ran away. So I'm going to have to get back to it because because I was like, oh, that's great, and I should have written it down, but I didn't run over there fast enough. Um, just trying to think um, as as we have gone through this, right? The services are doing some incredible work. Oh, I remember what it was: 360s feedback. General uh, retired Lieutenant General Walt Ulmer did was co-author of the Army study in the 70s. And he knows more about 360 degree feedback than most of us in the room will ever forget, right? He is, he's fantastic. He, t he doesn't really care what form it takes. The Army's got a way to do it, the Air Force has a way to do it, the Navy, the Navy and the Marine Corps all have ways to get input from subordinates. What General Ulmer calls it is supplemental, and that's an important word, subordinate feedback. Supplemental subordinate feedback. So me as a senior, me as a rater, when I'm writing evaluations, OPRs for you all, when I'm writing evaluations on my subordinates, right, when I look down at their happy faces, I'm seeing happy faces because those humans want to make me happy, so they are smile up at me, right? Now, when I tell them I value candor, they're like, mm, she says that, but does she really mean it? You know, is she going to shoot me the first time I give her bad news, right? When I walk around my subordinate spaces, right, when I, their work areas, I can tell a lot by walking around. If people are kind of afraid to look you in the eye, right, that's an indication of something. If people are engaging and they, they want to talk to you, but maybe a little too much, you're like, hmm, that's not a good either. Somewhere in the middle is you walk around and they engage you and they have thoughtful questions for you or thoughtful comments for you. And they're not just like running up to try to polish your shoes, right? Or carry your bags or get you coffee, right? They want to have a substantive conversation. That is a thinking organization. That is a growing organization. That is likely an organization that is full of dignity and respect for all people. So this supplemental subordinate input can take many forms. We have spreadsheet after spreadsheet of different ways to get that feedback. I will tell you, that's the most substantive thing that I can't wait as the services are all walking down this path, they're walking down the path separately, they're all kind of figuring it out. And so the faster we can figure out how to get that supplemental subordinate feedback, I think the better, the better place you'll be in because if you ask your subordinates what they think, you'll be surprised at what they say. You might be surprised, right? So I, I don't know if we have time for another one or... Go ahead. I'm going to... Do one more, and then when you tell me that it's time to stop, I'll stop. Yeah, so, so a couple things, and just to make sure that everybody understood, and I'm going to distill it down because I won't remember all the great things you said. Um, the captain asked, hey, in addition to the educational courses on leadership development that you get here at the Air Force Academy, what else is there that new officers, that you can share with new officers, new accessions, right? Pretty, did I get it pretty much? Okay. So. So there's two things, actually, and, and, and some of them are kind of repeats, and I'll kind of repackage them for, for the, this purpose. So first of all, again, Admiral Stockdale and others have said, take time to reflect. So you have to, you have to help your subordinates value that time to think. Now, it doesn't mean 
that you can like blow off all your other deadlines, right? So there's a time and a place to reflect and it's not probably every day, maybe it is. But, but that kind of dovetails behind the other actually more important step, which is talking about your own challenges. That storytelling serves many purposes and I will tell you as we've kind of gone around the different services, I've I haven't talked to any Army groups that have talked to a Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps. And every time do I talk to junior officers, junior enlisted, and senior, and senior NCOs, they are hungry to hear from their supervisors, right? So their immediate superior. They are hungry. And so I I'm going to tell you that telling your story of moral challenges or even telling your friend, if you haven't had, if you can't think of moral challenges or maybe it's too raw, I don't know. Um, and, but you have friends or these people that you're now networking with because you've not made the same mistake I did. Talk to them about your challenges. Talk to them about not just your successes, but talk to them about the times when you've graded yourself as coming up short. Those little um, vignettes are so valuable and they are a course in and of themselves. And if you have a friend who's really good at storytelling, bring them over and talk to your, um, your Rossi cadets, right? Because they're really, what we have seen is there is education and training and experience and, and some people group education and training together, and I know this morning I wrote down reflection because otherwise I wouldn't remember it. But maybe if you group education training together, right, then there's experience and reflection, right? So, d you know, you can categorize them any way, but any way you slice it, education and training are, are not going to work by themselves. There is absolutely a conversation that leaders, leaders have to insert themselves into the, into the experience base of their subordinates and it doesn't matter how little experience you think you have, I guarantee you've heard greater, you've heard some fantastic stories that you can pass along and, and your subordinates are hungry for that, hungry for that. Okay, I have time for one more question, sorry, go ahead. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So the question is about toxic leadership. And, and I try not to say toxic and leadership in the same sentence because it's really, they're really opposites, really. And people who create a toxic environment are not leaders. If we have selected them for leadership positions, then shame on us. That's kind of where I am. So we've done a lot of work with this to try to understand what are the most successful models for that supplemental subordinate feedback. Because right, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that your subordinates get to run the organization, right? Asking them for feedback is different from letting them have the keys to the, you know, to the shop or the keys to the jet and telling them, hey, go you know, have a great time. So there are 360s. There are psychometrics, um, you know, things like Myers-Briggs and Hogan that the services are all using. And then we have culture and climate surveys. So one of the things we're trying to get our arms around is how do you synchronize the use of those tools? How do you integrate the use of those tools? So you, so you if you are inclined, so there's the development part of a 360, and there's kind of you really wanting to understand, hey, is, am I, you know, you getting personal feedback. But then there's the Raider's responsibility to really understand his or her, her subordinate. And there are many tools to do that. There's psychometrics, there's 360, and there's culture and climate surveys. So what we have to do is we really have to focus. This is why I didn't talk about what I'm doing about sexual harassment and drug abuse or substance abuse and, and alcohol and 
things like that, right? Because we're trying to help the services raise the level of professionalism so that somebody who creates a toxic climate, if they're in 03 or 04, that they stand out in stark contrast so that if somebody, so an 06 thinks this 04 is better than sliced bread, but they create a toxic environment, you know, that doesn't mean you shoot them, right? That, don't shoot them and go, get that carcass out of here, right? You try to help them understand that they might be the most brilliant intellectual in, you know, in counterinsurgencies, right? Pick something, some hard, messy problem. But you need to work on your people skills, right? So they, they come up and they, they talk to you and they go, work on your people skills. And oh, by the way, next year I'm going to ask you how you've done this year. So there's a shared responsibility, right? We have to be open to feedback ourselves, but as leaders, we also have to be really good at finding those things that are a little, a little harder to find than BDA, right? So, thanks. All right. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Admiral Klein, for your message. Um, just on behalf of our 2014 NCLS participants, the cadet wing, and the faculty and staff of the Air Force Academy, we would like to present you with a small token of our appreciation. Ah, thank you. Ah,